Hello and welcome to episode 9 of the How to Survive podcast. My name's Chris. And my name is Joe. Joining me as ever. This week we're going to be talking about Everest, which came out this year. Yep. It's directed by Balthazar Kormaker, if I'm saying that incorrectly, I apologise, mm-hmm. uh, the Icelandic director. Um, this week's show is going to take on a slightly different tact uh, because of the nature of the film. Given that the film is based on a real life disaster and follows the events really closely mm. and the central characters are all real, real individuals, mm. uh, it's not really appropriate to um, speculate on how to survive. Um, but it is a film that at its core is about survival, so yeah. um, it makes sense to discuss it as a film. I think it's fair to say that the events of the film are almost entirely down to a sort of conflation of bad luck. Yeah. And these are professional people yeah. who uh, did what they could. They're smart people, they're trained. So if we were to suggest anything about how they survive, it would just be an insult to, yeah. to their... Um, to their, their expertise and to their memory. Yeah, exactly. Probably. But it, it could, it could this, I mean, next week we're going to do Titanic for the, our, our 10th anniversary special. The difference there, I think, is that Titanic isn't contemporary. It's, I mean, it's not in living memory. Yeah. And, and also, it's a film about the, like, the sinking of the ship rather mm. than about the people on it. It's a film set on a disaster yeah. rather than the actual, uh, a retelling of the actual yeah, disaster. Yeah, exactly. Titanic isn't so much about the disaster itself, is it? It's more about the. Yeah, the it, it could have taken plot. place on another uh, sinking ship. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and also it's interesting, I think, uh, as we're going to talk about, um, the way Everest handles a real life disaster is very different, despite mm. the fact that they're both high budget blockbuster films. Yes. Very different way of interpreting a disastrous event. Sure. I think it's kind of the framing of the tragedy means that the cliches are kind of avoided. So a a lot of it when we talk about horror movies and stuff we talk about the cliches and how like don't go in there or check under the bed things like that and that that wouldn't be appropriate here. No. Um, But let's talk about the film. Okay. Um, That's why we're here. It stars uh, it's got a very good cast actually. Yeah. Um, Jason Clark, I guess, is the uh, actor in the lead role, you yeah, would say. I'd he say plays so. Rob Hall, who is the uh, manager, owner of um, Adventure Consultants, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is a great name. It is good. Um, he's joined by uh, a number of climbers who are... Adventure Consultants is a company that offers trips up to the summit of Everest. Mm-hmm. Um, a we great, great expense. Yeah, $65,000 a time. Mm-hmm. This is in 96 as well, so adjust for inflation. Yeah, probably over a gra- over 100 grand, you yeah. imagine, nowadays. Uh, but some of his customers are uh, Doug Hansen, who's a mailman, he's played by John Hawkes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Beck Weathers, who uh, is played by Josh Brolin. The doctor. He's a doctor and a climbing enthusiast. Yeah. Um, Rob Hall's wife is played by Kieran Knightley, Jan mm-hmm. Hall. And uh, Helen Wilton, uh, played by Emily Watson, um, is the sort of coordinator at base camp mm-hmm. for their climbing. Um, also, a few side characters are um, Scott Fisher, who uh, owns the rival Mountain Madness mm-hmm. operation. Played by Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, and John Krakauer, who is the author of a book which has come out since the disaster. The year after, the Into Thin Air. Into Thin Air. Uh, and he's a journalist, he's played by Michael Kelly. Mm-hmm. Also on Rob's climbing uh, team uh, is, is Yasuko Namba, uh, played by Naoko Mori, who has summited six of the world's seven top peaks, and this is going to be her seventh. So um, it's an account of a real life disaster, as we mm. said, uh, which happened in 1996. It was at the time the worst disaster on. Mount Everest. Yes. Um, the exact details of the disaster are sort of disputed yeah. um, between the various parties who survived. But the basic facts are 1996 was a particularly busy year for commercial climbing on Everest. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know there were many more people than they were perhaps used to or equipped to deal with yes. going up the, uh, up, the, and up the mountain. Particularly what their equipment was equipped to deal with. Mm. Mm. Uh, and a number of different companies were all, were all involved in uh, trying to climb up the summit. The, the film opens with um, a number of the characters sort of departing mm-hmm. for uh, Nepal um, and uh, heading to base camp. You know, there's a lot of, sort of almost like a montage of scenes of them going through 
yeah. the meeting yeah. each other, going yeah. through Nepal. Hiking. Mm-hmm. There's quite a lot of character development, which is quite good because... Yeah. Um, you, you, one of the things about this film, you mentioned character development, is you do care about all of them. Hmm. There's no baddies. No. I mean, the, there are, it is the South African team who are kind of... There's one scene where you think, oh, they're a bit mean. But generally, you're rooting the whole time for all of them. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the villain, I suppose, is, is nature. The mountain. Yeah. That, in fact, the, the German, the Russian guy, hmm. he says, like, yeah, we are all friends. We need to watch out because the mountain is a real enemy. Yeah. Good impression. He's quite, he's quite right. Yeah. So they eventually make their way to base camp, and again, there's various scenes of them acclimatizing. Mm-hmm. Uh, meet, you know, g- developing a bond with one another. Uh, you know, we learn a few things like Doug is a mailman who uh, tried to climb Everest the year before mm-hmm. and failed at the sort of final hurdle. He's come back this time. He's determined to finish it, uh, and he wants to make the children of his local school proud. Mm-hmm. His children yeah. as well, um, who are waiting for him back in the United States. Yeah, um, they helped him to raise the money as well through various fundraisers. So yeah. he, he's taken, on their behalf, a small flag that he plans to plant in the summer. Yeah. Beck Weathers is a, an experienced climber. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple of scenes which almost set him up to be, you know, you're saying about not having a villain, but right. he's perhaps the closest the film comes to really sending a character towards that sort of um, unpleasant side of the spectrum. Right. There's a scene where um, he realises it's his anniversary with his wife and he's yeah. failed to get in touch with her. Um, the conversations between them is very stilted and uh, you know there's it's perhaps um, implied their marriage is yeah, on the rocks a bit, a bit of a hilt and uh, there's also the scene where when crossing a ladder bridge that's been constructed he gets very irate obviously because he's, he's afraid mm. but uh, the way he snaps is uh, is reminiscent of in these sorts of films you're looking it's almost like you're lo- on the lookout uh, in typical films like this for little character traits that might lead to you know selfishness later yeah on. yeah mm. um he, he snaps you know, i paid sixty five thousand dollars for this i don't expect to be risking my life yeah yeah and it's kind of like Q- like, waiting in line yeah yeah um so he's a bit impatient uh you know most of the other characters are sort of um neither here nor there they're right. not 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 well, as yeah, well developed as those three. Yeah, I mean John Krauk is dead. I think simply because he wrote the book. Yeah, and the Japanese lady Yusuke Namba. Oh, she's quite a sympathetic character. Yeah, I mean, she's, when you, when she's on screen, you do feel like oh, she's really nice. Yeah, but she's very quiet. She doesn't yeah. really have a no, lot. She's, she's not a, a, a loud presence in the film. No. Not as much as Josh Brolin, obviously. Yeah. Rob Hall, however, is given quite a lot of character development mm-hmm. because his wife is back home. Uh, she's heavily pregnant. And um, yeah, one of the few cliches of the film. Yeah, but then it's a real, it's yeah, a true exactly. story. So yeah. you can't really. It's it's difficult to level cliche as an yeah. accusation at the film because it's it's what happened. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know Jake Gyllenhaal is a sort of um, stoner surfer dude right. guy. Yeah. You know, Surfs up, man. Yeah, that sort of thing. Mount yeah. Everest. Um, and there's a few other side characters, but basically they uh, mountain madness and. Adventure consultants decided to team up, yeah. uh, go up the mountain together. Because of various problems like congestion mm. and uh, some of the climbers becoming ill because of the altitude and the lack of oxygen, yeah. um, they miss their turnaround time, which is the time at which they're supposed to start coming back down the mountain in order to be safe. Mm-hmm. It's like two o'clock. The last of them don't start coming down until half four, mm. and this obviously spells trouble. And then a massive weather front rolls in as well, which Very causes... Quickly. Yeah, which causes which spells big trouble, basically. Mm -hmm. This is where the disaster element of uh, the film comes in, and um, a blizzard hits during their descent, um, and eight people end up dead. Right. The first of the the group to to perish is um, Doug, Mm -hmm. the mailman. He was holding up the group, and uh, Rob stays behind to help him get to the summit and achieve his goal, Mm. and then on the way back down... I mean, 100 metres away, and he's like, I have to make it. I'm yeah. not going to come back again. With this, so. Yeah, and uh, he manages to make it, but on the way back down, he becomes severely hypoxic, and he can barely move. Yeah. Eventually, he sort of stands up, trying to help himself along this narrow ledge, and just falls off. Mm-hmm. And it's very sudden as well. And it's the first death of the film, mm. uh, at least on screen. You know, there's a few characters who... Um, or a few people who may be oblique references to people who have died. Right, yeah. Like, there's a... a a, uh, Frozen bodies. And yeah, well, there's a Nepalese man as well who's um, 
coughing up blood who you see right yes and that is potentially there was there was a nepalese guide who when they were transporting porting gear up had a pulmonary embolus which is one of the things that the film highlights is like a potential risk of the high altitude so doug yeah doug just he almost just disappears out, of, out into thin air you could say yeah and um it's, it's really quite um traumatic yeah and but, well at, at this point they're all sort of running out of oxygen as well hmm. so everyone's kind of like claustrophobic and lightheaded yeah and the reaction that rob has is kind of one of massive grief because it's his friend as well yeah and he's just like panicking and despairing yeah Rob attempts to descend the mountain. One of his team comes up to try and get some oxygen to him and help him. They both become stranded on the mountain, uh, very near the summit, um, trapped by the weather. Mm-hmm. And they try to huddle, huddle out and, and together for warmth. Yeah, and uh, his teammate dies during the night when he becomes so hypothermic that he um, starts taking off his clothes, which is a, a symptom of hypothermia, yeah, as it's, it's highlighted. Up, yeah. yeah in the earlier earlier in the film and again he he basically falls to his death Mm -hmm. very very suddenly um meanwhile a few other characters get into a lot of trouble yeah uh jake chillinghall's character scott he kind of just realizes the game's up i think and Mm. tries to give up as quickly as possible yeah beck and yusuko uh also end up falling down this sort of long slope yeah um and, and they, they uh, lack the sort of strength to get back up again. Yeah. Um, well, there is a th- another person with them who is then rescued by someone else who runs in back into the, where they are, yeah. takes them away. But they assu- they they realise Yusuko is dead because they sort of check and she's very obviously dead. Yeah. And they sort of look at Beck and think, oh, he's dead. But you see then from Beck's perspective that he isn't. Yeah. And he sees him sort of disappearing. Yeah. Um, and so obviously things go from bad to worse and uh, a, number, a number of people end up severely injured mm-hmm. or uh, in need of medical attention one way or another. Um, Beck's uh, wife back home is told that they think he's dead. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Rob Hall uh, manages to have a final farewell conversation with his pregnant wife back mm-hmm. home, Jan, uh, in what is quite a difficult scene to watch. Yeah. Um, she agrees to call their child Sarah. Yeah, at the beginning of the film, she says, "No way, I'm not going to call her Sarah." Yeah, but yeah. it's um, it's pretty heart wrenching mm. to watch. And uh, this is another point at which the film sort of obviously again they can't deviate from the real life tragedy. Right. But um, I think even even though you know it's real, like I didn't know the nat- I didn't know the specifics of the disaster when I went in. Right. Um, and I sort of assumed that because he was the main character, Rob Paul had plot armour, you know, mm. like he wasn't going to die because right. he's the main character. Yeah, exactly. Um, even, even during that final phone call, and then obviously you realise that he, he never made it down from the mountain. Yeah. Um, which makes that whole exchange with his wife really more, yeah. heart-wrenching. Mm-hmm. Um, Beck is revealed to actually be alive and yeah. stumbles back to the camp Covered, covered in frostbite, frostbite yeah. and uh, in a, in a very bad way, and uh, in the films, I guess fi- one of the final scenes, they uh, manage. His to wife calls the embassy in Nepal, yeah, and negotiates the, to send a, an army helicopter up to retrieve him. Yeah, but the the helicopter is too heavy uh, to sort of work in that thin air. Yeah, so they take it back down again, strip out all the the stuff they don't need, like the, hel- the, the, the chairs and the the co pilot. And they go back up and, and pull him back down. And it's quite an exciting scene as well because you do get the. Um, the it's quite dramatic, you know. Yeah, like yeah. It's a dramatic rescue, but they do manage to rescue him at the cost of his hands and nose, nose from mm. frostbite. Yeah, and so the film so film basically ends uh, on that note, really, like with a sort of respectful um, memorial to the to the uh, to those who died. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, it's it's a very bleak film. It's very um, unrelenting, I'd yeah. say, uh, which is probably a reflection of the subject matter. Yeah, mm. exactly, and the, and the mountain itself, really. Yeah, I well, mean, the, the stats at the beginning of the film kind of sum it up. Like, Hillary... Sum it up. Oh, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Pun not intended. Yeah. Uh, Hillary summited Everest, and after that, one in four people who tried it yeah. were killed, which is astounding. Yeah. 
and it's crazy. Yeah, it's like it's kind of like it must be. A, you must be a bit over overly brave to do it in the first place. There's no overall explanation for why the people are doing the things they're doing. There's a mm. scene where John Krakauer, the journalist, is saying, "Why? You know, why do you want to do this?" Yeah. Um, which is a bit ridiculous because he's there doing it himself. Yeah, I think um, he's doing it on invitation, though, isn't he? Yeah, but he um, in the in real life, he was invited originally to the article. Uh, and his article was just going to involve going out to base camp. No, oh, really. And he uh, apparently it re- going out to base camp reignited his love of climbing as a child. Okay. And he went, he asked his editor to postpone the article that he was writing for a year so he could train and summit. get up to the summit, yeah. um, which he does manage. Yeah. Um, but it is uh, he asked the his fellow climbers why they're doing it. You know why? What's the, what's the reason? And basically, the only reason that they have is to, is because it's there. Yeah. You know, which they will say they will Together, sort of sing yeah. in unison. Like it's a, a motto. Yeah. But yeah, it seems to be a challenge, and they're like, well, why not? Yeah. And then um, John Hawkes, Doug Hansen gives the best speech when he says, like, I'm just doing it basically because I want to be a, a, a good role model to, yeah. to people around me. Yeah. He wants to. He wants his children to grow up believing that. Mm. Even if something looks impossible, they, they, there's you know it's, it's within and their. There grasp. is something quite inspirational about all of them as well. Yeah, because it's no mean feat to climb Everest. Yeah, well, right. well, what I was going to say was that the film is great at communicating like the effort required, mm. um, and uh, like what a feat of human endurance. Like it really does translate across. Yeah, and I they say at the beginning that it's. I don't know why you want to do it because it's just pain. Yeah, and that does come across. Yeah, like it's it's. Um, it's simultaneously like made me want to climb up a mountain mm. and maybe never want to go anywhere near a mountain ever again. Right, yeah. Like a small mountain, but yeah. not, not Everest. It looks it looks so hard. Yeah. And the film does communicate that really well. Like every um every like step, like I'm I was watching it like aching with the characters who yeah. are climbing up. And then like thinking like it really does uh translate, I think, to the mm. audience. And like, you know, you, f- you sat, I, you know, I felt like short of breath, and I felt, uh, you know, tired watching them, like struggling to get up there. Yeah, I agree. It's it's quite a taxing film, both emotionally and physically. physically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though you're not actually climbing the mountain, you yeah. still feel exhausted by the end of it. Yeah, and yeah, really good film. I, I mean, I don't know if you can say you enjoy a film like this. Yeah. In the same way that you might enjoy a comedy, but it was. I mean, it set out what it intended to do and what you wanted it to do. Yeah. And and it was it was probably because I didn't know the subject matter. Yeah, it was surprising. You know, like well, uh, you know, that is in. I, yeah, I didn't even know it was a true story before the film. Yeah, like, genuinely, <laughs> the, the really well like, researched, yeah. uh, well informed people going in. Um, there, there are very few criticisms of the film, but I mean, one of them I would have would be that it does sometimes stray into how do they know that happened. Yeah, no, I, I, I was thinking that. Yeah. Um, I mean, you take take other historical uh, disaster films, like, say, The Perfect Storm, mm-hmm. or Alive, or Pompeii. There's no way you could know what really happened. Yeah. And uh, take the example of, I think, the guy's called Andy, who comes to help Rob yeah. uh, with the canister. He, he dies of hypothermia by taking his clothes off falling mm-hmm. in the film. But I don't know if that necessarily did happen in no. real life. And the same with Duck. You don't know how they died exactly, just that yeah. they probably fell. So the, the the artistic license there is being used. Yeah. And I know that uh, Scott Fisher, who is played by Jake Gyllenhaal, his wife's come forward and said he was nothing like that. And there's the scene where Anatoly, the, the Russian guy, yeah. he, he sort of stumbles into camp, like wind blasted. Yeah. And he, he runs up to the tent and says, help, 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 help. And John Cracker says, I can't help you, I'm snow blind. And apparently, He's, he's come forward since the film came out and said, I was never at any point snowblind. So not to say I would have gone and helped, but I, I certainly was a snowblind. Well, so I there, think, is, there is a lot of artistic sort of license being used here. Yeah, I think, I think his, um, his objection to that scene was because Anatoly's actually asking him to help Anatoly. Yeah, help me, help me. Yeah, help, no, as in help um, find the others who right. are still out there. Yeah. Um, and it does, it does, it's odd because that scene did, st- did stick out to me. At the time, it's quite harrowing. That it's um, it's uh, it's quite harrowing, but it's also it makes John Krakauer out to be a coward, a little bit. But that's beca- that that's because 
his that scene is only shown with him mm. and like it's not unfair to you know suggest that he wouldn't be in any state physically to, yeah or emotionally yeah but i think it's interesting how they they only show him having that exchange with john cracker and none mm. of the other characters yeah and um like as you say john Krakauer has come out and said this never happened mm. um the other book that's written about um this incident is called The Climb and it's right. written by Anatoly. Oh, really? Um, and his uh, version of the... Because there's some debate, like I said, about the finer details mm -hmm. and, a, of, you know, who was doing what, when and why. Yeah. Um, there's a point made of Anatoly not using oxygen, not using oxygen yeah. canisters. He says, I, I, I don't climb with, uh, with oxygen. I think, they think we need it, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. well, he says, he says it, it, um, you become reliant on it and right. then when you run out, you're in trouble, mm -hmm. which is... What it, happens it in the does film. happen, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he is actually directly responsible for saving at least two or three oh, yeah, of the he, people. He's the hero of the film in many yeah. ways. Just um, the most like, level-headed person and just... Hard as nails. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he, um, he said that the reason he uh, came down the mountain when the storm was about to hit, rather than helping other people come down the mountain, mm -hmm. was because he wanted to prepare himself physically to be in a position to be able to help the anyone who's coming back down, like right. bring them oxygen. Yeah. Um, whereas if he had stayed up higher, he wouldn't have been able to do that. Yeah. Um, which makes sense and he does help people. But I think it's interesting because this film isn't actually based on Into Thin Air or The Climb. No, it's kind of a, a conflation of all of them. Yeah, but it's um, because it's based on an overall understanding of the events. It doesn't take one side or the other, but it doesn't officially take one side or the other, mm. but this does sort of lean towards... Him being a bit of a hero. Yeah, and yeah. John Krakow not being. Because it's interesting that they show specifically him yeah. being the one who's unable or unwilling to help that is interesting. save people. I mean, I guess you'd have to ask the director. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, we're not going to be able to answer that here. But you can understand why John Krakow is been dissatisfied. Upset, but, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. But you can also understand why Scott Fisher's wife might be upset with his portrayal. Yeah, because he's he's sort if, of like a feckless yeah. uh, stoner character. Yeah, yeah. But and he, uh, if if he's not actually like that, if it's yeah, just it's, Jake Gyllenhaal going, well, I'm just going to play him like this. Speaking of Jake Gyllenhaal's scenes, yeah, uh, I'm very pleased that Starbucks were able to get uh, yeah, I saw the top that, of yeah. the top of the mountain. Uh, the North Face as well is all over the film. The yeah. uh, clothing brand, really? Yeah, outdoor clothing. I brand. Meant the North Face of Everest. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Um, you know that other speaking of the North Face. Uh, the, there's, he kind of looks at that other group with the binoculars he's like oh I'll see you yeah. I think they die maybe yeah I think uh, they're another group yeah, yeah separately there, there was a group of uh, three Tibetan police yes or Tibet border or something like that who were border, killed in the same, the same day on yeah. the North Face that's yeah. not mentioned in the film but I thought well, I wonder whether that was well the, it's, again it's like a sort of oblique reference to it isn't it yeah which is, which is an acknowledgement yeah um, but I thought I thought it was a Overall, a really good film, mm. um, and uh, like the special effects, we saw it in two D. Yes. Or I saw. It. We, yeah, I did. Yeah. We saw it in two D. There are three D screenings available as well, and IMAX. Screenings. Yes. Uh, we just weren't able to or mm. unwilling. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, the 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 you know special effects are great, cinematography is great, um, and all the performances are pretty good yeah, as well. You know, there's not a bad performance at least. Yeah. That's which it. is often you know you, there's often. In, especially in big budget films like this, you know, like that can sometimes fall by the wayside, but they, they were all pretty universally good. Yeah. I thought. And like watching the film, because uh, like when we talk about horror films, we talk about like, you know, there are, there are, there's like an order of events mm. or, you know, like a certain things that happen in horror films that make you think, oh, I know what's going to happen because, you know, like, so it's, it's, you know, an understood motif that yeah. if, uh, if a girl is really promiscuous, She'll like, probably yeah. be killed. Yeah. yeah. Like, if you see The Cabin in the Woods, the film that's basically deconstructing all those sort of cliches, mm -hmm. like, you, you have an idea of the sort of things that we mean. Yes. But I fell into, even though this is, again, like a real-life tragedy, I, watching this film, I did fall into the same traps of, like, thinking, oh, Beck's a bit nasty, yeah. so I think he's going to die. Mm -hmm. Or, you know... I mean, the one that did come to fruition was Doug because that's like he's set up to be like the tragic yeah, guy. Yeah, because he's just like just so nice and yeah. yeah. But, but I, they, did, I, I think they all were. I mean, it shocked me that Yasuko was 
one of the people who died because yeah because i i think among all of them her death affected me the most because it was just so like bleak yeah like everyone else kind of was either instant or they were like I mean, it, hers off, seemed ca- like, off camera. Or yeah, you know. hers seemed like the most sort of pointless death. Yeah, like just, I, I'm not. I'm not saying in real life anyone. You know, I'm yeah. saying in this film, it looked like she could have been helped. Do you know? Yeah, yeah. It mm. was sort of like one of one of the more. I mean, they're all tragic deaths, but yeah. like it was a tragedy that those specific events put her in that position. Yeah. Because also, you know, like all of the characters really, aside from Doug, I suppose are experienced climbers but even Doug has almost made it to the summit before yeah exactly so like it's I mean like one of the reasons that we're not talking about how to survive as you said at the start is because Mm. other than the fact that it's obviously inappropriate Mm. it's difficult to be like oh well if you'd you know taken an extra bottle of oxygen yeah the, 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 the things that go wrong you know they're going wrong because it's like okay we need to turn back Oh no! Can I just go up? Okay, I and mean, they make a point of it being a bad decision. Yeah. So it's not like we can go. Don't. I mean, just don't do those things, and you'll live. Like, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go up Mount Everest. Or yeah. Whatever, you know? yeah. But yeah, like you, you, I fell into the trap of reading the film a certain way, and then obviously, real, real, real life doesn't work like that. No. Exactly. Rob Hall doesn't survive because he's the main character. No. And he doesn't survive because he's got a pregnant wife back home. No. That was that was like I said before. Like I said back at the start, that that's kind of a cliche, but it, like an unavoidable one because it's true. Yeah. Uh, but there weren't any others really. I mean, no. maybe the rift between the rival companies. Yeah, not even that because that's not really made much of. No. Uh, but they the, they team up. The, I mean, I mean more the rift between Beck and Peach. Like you think, yeah. oh, he'll die now because of this this argument they had. Yeah. But then he doesn't. Yeah. So it's kind of. I don't know. There's, yeah, no, I, I, I yeah. There, I think there's there's some cliches that you can't avoid. Yeah. But then they weren't played in this as cliches. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's weird, isn't it? It's difficult. Um, it's difficult to to talk about, you know, the writing or the the way it's plotted out because, because the, it's a true story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's some of it may seem unbelievable, but it's yeah. not. I guess if they'd made sort of Scott Fisher into a like villainous megalomaniac and he's like yeah. oh I've taken all the canisters for myself yeah uh, that would be a bit cliche have you seen the film Vertical Limit possibly uh, because I was reminded of that as like a sort of that is the cliche mountain climbing film right so the story of Vertical Limit is like a brother and sister who are estranged slightly after the death of their father mm-hmm. Uh, the the sister goes climbing on a mountain trying to scale this really difficult peak and uh, they fall into a crevasse and a team of expert climbers goes up the mountain to try and save them by you know with some explosives to blow them mm-hmm. out of the, not like blow them up <laughs> not like drop them under the and like fire yeah. them out like yeah. a cannon um, you know like to get rid of the to unbury them yes you know um, and in that you have all the cliches like you know the brother and sister bond there's like an old time uh climber he's like oh he's the best climber in the world and uh, it turns out he had a wife and another one of the climbers uh was uh, on a cl- climb with her and she died right and uh, he blames him and all that right, sort of thing yeah, yeah. so it's all those sorts of cliches are packed in to that um but this Whereas is this like one's like a cliche free yeah, yeah. In, in a sense which is good um, as we said before as well all the characters very likeable uh, there's no villains in that sense no one's stealing the gas canisters yeah yeah and, but the, I think the South African team who were like I'm, I'm not, not gonna I'm not gonna sit here and listen to this yeah. we've gotta get up that mountain it's like Scouts <laughs> yeah it Scouts like. African well yeah. again so the South Africans say <laughs> they're, they're unwilling to negotiate right? yeah yeah uh, and they think it's all ridiculous. But then that never comes to... Like, it seems like an unexplored thing yeah. like, from an early draft of the script. I mean, it doesn't matter because it's not important in the end. But the other thing that's kind of like that is the guy who's sort of frantically ch- checking the, yeah. the gas canisters. And he's like... like I watching it... Because the, when, when they're training to go up the mountain, yeah. they, say, they say, look out for things like irrational behaviour because it's a sign of hyperthermia. Yeah. And this is at the, the, the crux of the when everyone's got hypothermia yeah. and he's doing this like weird 
frantic, like yeah, oxygen. Yeah, checking. and it's like he's kind of just like single-minded, and the guy's like, "Come down!" He's like, "No, I have to check." It's kind of like I felt like that was a sign of madness. Yeah, but then they just like, "Oh, that's not." But it's not. Yeah. It's actually yeah. He's actually there is some. Confusion. I mean, they're, they're, those are the sort of moments where like when you're watching a film like this, you're just you've got your head in your hands because you're like, I'm I'm just so sad that this happened. Yeah, like it's so horrible that so horrible that there actually wasn't any more oxygen oxygen yeah. for them and like you know because that's the result of a miscommunication isn't right it? Yeah, like, yeah. the other thing that comes up um, which they discuss in training is the high altitude pulmonary edema yeah and the symptoms associated with that which are your like coughing and yeah, yeah. and Wheezing. blood coming out of your mouth yeah and everyone by the end is like water white <laughs> yeah and yeah. Um, but you do see when they first say it they kind of it's voiceover and there's that Nepalese guy coughing up blood. Yeah. So then every time someone's coughs, you're like, oh no, they're going to cough up blood. Yeah. But they don't. But yeah, it's it's pretty um, it's pretty like level-headed. I mm. think the whole way through, there's not really any like hysterical no. bits or anything like that. No, exactly. And nothing I think pushes credibility at any point either. No. Like uh, it's all. It's it's like probably as close as you can get to like a documentary without. Being an actual yeah, and of course it does take artistic license, but it's a Hollywood yeah. film, so you can forgive it. Yeah, uh, my my girlfriend Hannah said that one of the things she took away was that men and women uh, were both very fairly represented. Yeah, that there's there's no like all all acts of heroism are kind of gender neutral. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in many ways, the 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 lady who is sort of running the base camp, Helen Wilton, she. It's kind of the, the controlling presence that she's yeah. trying to get it all together, and you do see her, the emotional attacks it has on her, and that yeah. is very, very, very well acted by Emily Watson. Yeah. But I feel like I kind of feel like she's the coordinator. Yeah, generally a, a, a good a good film for gender politics, a lot yeah. better than uh, The Hills Have Eyes last yeah, year. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So from the from the look of the film, from the trailers and the posters and the marketing and all that sort of thing, it it sort of comes across as a film that's like about human survival against all odds. Right. And you know, in this, I think they're sort of marketing it as a counterpoint to Gravity. Yeah. In fact, the taglines are really similar as well. So the tagline of Gravity is "Don't let go," mm -hmm. and the tagline of Everest is "Never let go." Right. So there's a lot of similarities, not only in the sort of subject matter, mm -hmm. you know, human survival, um, or you know, the, what comes across in the marketing, mm -hmm. but obviously the way they're trying to market it. Is yeah, quite exactly. Yeah. But and I did that to an extent. Because I'd only seen the trailer, I didn't like do any research in this film because I did want to go in like completely fresh. Yeah, and I was expecting I didn't know it was a true story for one thing. Uh, so you know I was thinking this because I really think Christian Bale was going to be in it. Yeah, and I was expecting this like big sort of chest thumping Hollywood blockbuster. Yeah, but that's not really what it is. No, it's not really a film about human survival at all. It's more about like the unforgiving nature of like Mount Everest or you know like the the unforgiving nature of these sorts of climbs yeah you know, and the things that can go wrong and how badly they can and go. moreover the specific one yeah it's exactly the, yeah. yeah yeah and I think even though it's like you said it's a, it's a specific, about a specific event mm. it's about a very niche activity really you know it's yeah. extreme mountain climbing um, it does the film does a really good job of like keeping everything coherent for like someone who doesn't know anything about mountain climbing yes. or you know like you you understand the risks you understand sort of um the dangers and like the the techniques or the mm. technology that they have to have with them you know if it's gas canisters or whatever yeah like you understand the stakes you understand what they're going to try and do to prevent bad things happening mm. like you understand why they need to turn around and yeah. when they do and, and when, when they start saying things like Hil the Hillary step yeah. you don't know need to be intimate with Everest yeah. to know that the Hillary step is probably something like hard insurmountable <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah someone something that someone would have their name yeah after yeah it reminded me of a documentary by Kevin McDonald I don't know if you've seen it called Touching the Void right which is a mountain climbing documentary which is the sort of quintessential like human survival against all odds mm -hmm. in which two people are descending a mountain and one of them breaks their leg oh, okay. and uh, his friend is trying to lower him down the mountain and accidentally lowers him over a cliff edge right and he, he survives well he, yeah because he, he cuts he yeah. cut, ends up cutting the rope like cutting his friend loose and sending him to what he assumes is his death in this crevasse mm. but he survives despite all of his injuries and crawls back 
down the mountain over like a period of days and gets found and survives. And that is an incredible story. Were they friends after that? Yeah, yeah. I think I think No hard um, feelings, pal. No, I think I think there is like a culture of that in the mountain. You know, yeah. like you understand the risks if you're going in, as do the characters. Yeah. The exactly. like you, you don't get the impression that but they're all saying just friend. just leave Doug because as much as it'd be nice to save him, yeah. we don't want to lose both of you. No. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that, that's like, that came across as well, the human sort of decision of how much is a life worth. Yeah. And but like, and like how, uh, how, how you come to the decision, you know, like Scott, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's character just says to leave him. Yeah. You know, like he knows the implication of that as yeah, well. Like exactly. everyone in the scene knows what's happening. And it's, it's pretty, um, those sort of things do add a, a, an element of, of tragedy and, you know, more tragedy. Mm-hmm. And um, I think they're really done very well and very tastefully. Yeah. But if uh, if anyone is really liked Everest, I would recommend um, watching Touching the Void because, okay. like I said, if you like I said about this film, feeling like you're aching afterwards, oh, Touching the Void, you'll be like. Counting your lucky stars. You'll you have um, high altitude pulmonary edema from watching <laughs> touching the voice. Yeah. I, I, I was researching the film after watching it for this yeah. um, discussion we're having now. And it, you know what? This is something that comes up every time I'm doing research. I always go on the, the IMDb trivia. And I never just recycle the thing because, I mean, it's, it's interesting to sort of frame it. Yeah. But I'm always astounded at some of the stuff people consider to be interesting. Yeah. Like, Kira Knightley shot her scenes in six days. Yeah. It's like, who cares? Like, who's <laughs> taking the time out of their yeah. like schedule? Not only to re- report on that, but the people are, are like are liking this, and like you know, it's got a thing like this is useful, and no one's finding that interesting or useful. Kira Knightley shot this in six days. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Mm. But overall, a really good film. Mm. I think it's fair to say. Yeah, um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you tuned in uh, to the How to Survive podcast, expecting. Tips on how to survive? Yeah, I, uh, mountain survival yeah. tips. Sorry to disappoint. Yeah, we, do, we don't really want to... No, I, I think at the top we said why, and yeah. hopefully that still stands up. Um, yeah, but I think I think the film still merits discussion because yes. it's a similar sort of film to the kinds of films that we cover, yeah. and uh, it's a current film. People are going to be interested about mm-hmm. it. And um, and if you if you do want tips on how to survive in movies, refer to the previous eight episodes, which yeah. are all filled with tips on uh, horror movie survival and if, if you are listening uh, we do want to hear from you our email address is how to survive show at gmail.com um, you can address it to Chris or Joe or both of us um, if you have any thoughts on Everest or if you have any sort of thoughts on what we should watch next I mean next week we're going to be watching and talking about Titanic which will be our 10th episode and is worthy therefore of a big the biggest blockbuster film of all time, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, so, if you feel it's inappropriate to talk about a historical tragedy in that light, <laughs> then don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Titanic next week, uh, the second in our series of real life disaster yeah. movies. And uh, I think it'll be interesting to n- note how different- The sort of representations are. Exactly, mm. yeah. Because um, there are, in, in, even in Titanic, there are real people depicted. Yeah, it's just the, the the main characters are fake. Yeah, but even yeah, I think well, we'll discuss that when we when we come to the film. Yeah. But I still think that the tone of Titanic is Completely. it's, it's uh, kind of it's hysterical. Yeah, like, in a way that Everest up, isn't dialed up all the way. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's romanticized. Yes. and made even Comic made bookie. it's it's an attempt to make it even more tragic. Mm. But actually, it's it's less tragic. Than it's melodrama. Like, exactly. Like yeah. melodrama. Whereas this is just this is how it is and yeah. you're not going to like it yeah it's yeah. As, as bleak and unrelenting as Everest itself right but yeah uh, thanks very much for listening tune in again next week and uh, in the meantime uh, is there anything clever we can say don't don't go up Everest is my advice <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to actually have that as the ending <laughs>